So let's talk about chapters 11 and 12 of the uh, Rudra Sanghita, Srishti Kanda. Why do these chapters, not only these chapters, but several others, talk about rituals of Shiva worship that are very difficult, if not impossible, for the average person to perform. Even today, I have to say, after visiting many temples, I have not seen the full Shiva Puja performed, except in really big temples with several brahmanas and very learned priests chanting all the mantras and so on. Very elaborate, very complete. So what is the use for us to hear about them or read about them? Well, there's going to be a story in an upcoming episode about a young boy living in a village. And uh, there's some problem with the family. I forget what it is exactly. But anyway, he says, I have heard in the scriptures that any problem can be set right by worship of Shiva. So he decides to go and sit in an isolated place on the bank of a river and perform worship of Shiva. But he comes from a very poor village. He doesn't have any money. He can't buy all of the paraphernalia and all the ingredients of worship. So he also heard that the worship of Shiva can be performed with the body, words, or mind. So he says, well, I'll just perform the worship exactly as described in the scriptures in my mind. So he does this, and he persists for some time. And as a result of this, Shiva becomes visible to him and grants his desires. So what does this mean for us? It means that we can hear or narrate or read these pastimes of worship of Shiva and visualize them in our minds and get the same result because the worship can be performed by body, words, or the mind. This is called Manasa Puja. Manasa means of the mind, and Puja means worship. So Manasa Puja is a perfectly legitimate and effective way to satisfy Shiva and get whatever benedictions that we desire. That's why these elaborate descriptions of a high-level worship of Shiva are included in the scripture, even though, of course, they know most people aren't going to be able to implement it with the body. But with the mind and words, you certainly can implement it. About the only thing that's left out of the descriptions in Shiva Purana are the actual mantras. And that's because the mantras are supposed to be received from a guru by disciplic succession. But the mantras are also there in the Vedas and Agamas. Confirmed. <laughs> My buddy the cow over here. Uh, these are referenced in the printed version or the ebook version of the Shiva Purana, which you can download from the links in the video description. Uh, and uh, there are footnotes underneath all the pages that describe these different esoteric mantras that refer back to the uh, mostly the Atarva Veda and then some of the Shiva Agamas. 
So if you really want to, you can learn those mantras. But practically speaking, I have found that the five-syllable mantra, Aung Namah Shivaya, <laughs> that's the mommy cow, yeah, work just as well, if not better, than all these fancy mantras. But if you want to, just, you know, for the sake of form, you can look them up and you can read them or have someone else recite them as you're doing the puja or you can memorize them uh, and chant them as you're doing the puja. Whether you do the puja with the body or in the mind, you will still get the result. So that kind of covers chapter 11. What about chapter 12? Chapter 12 is very interesting because in the beginning it talks about shivalingas, which we've already uh, heard about quite a bit in previous chapters. But it also talks about the ultimate realization and how that uh, simply watching the puja is good or hearing about the puja, but actually performing the puja is better. And then better than that is the sacrifice of austerity. Austerity means like fasting. Uh, I don't mean there's so many austerities described in the Vedas and Agamas uh, that you can perform. Drinking only water, uh, sitting next to fires in hot weather or sitting in water in cold weather. Uh, you know, all these things are considered austerities, tapasya, remaining silent, and so on. But better than that is mantra japa, japa yagna. Thousand times better, the scripture says. And thousand times better than that is dhyana yagna, meditation. And even better than that is jnana yajna, realization, self-realization. And the scripture then says, this is the line that the, the Neo-Edwaitans seize upon and use to rationalize their nonsense. They take it out of context, okay? So, but here it is, that for one who attains the final enlightenment, self-realization, that there are no rules, no obligations. Uh, they're completely free to do whatever they like, and it will not change their condition in the least. But what happens is that unscrupulous people take advantage of this statement, take it out of context, and then claim falsely to be realized. And of course, there's there's no objective proof of self-realization. It's completely subjective, right? So the actual uh, context that it appears in also says, just a few lines later, and I've highlighted this in the video, the chapter 12 video, that if you try to attain complete self-realization without doing the pujas, you fall down. In fact, it says, you certainly will fall down. And this is the case with the Neo-Edwaitans. We see that even though they are very sophisticated and pretend to be self-realized, and they know all the lines, you know, they've got the script down pat, they still engage in materialistic activities. And this becomes very controversial because on the one hand, it is well known in Indian culture that the self-realized people sometimes behave in really bizarre ways. You know, they can do anything, and so they do. But then again, a lot of the self-realized people don't act up in weird ways 
but they externally follow all the rules and regulations that apply to their social position. Varn Ashram, or whatever happens to be the social standard in, at that time. Why is that? To show a good example. Like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, that I perform my duties according to the rules and regulations of society. He appeared as a kshatriya, a king. So he followed all the principles of the dharma of a king. And he said, if I should stop working, even though I have nothing to do, everything would fall apart. Because, why? The people will follow the example. Uh, people follow the example of a great personality. So if there's a great personality, someone who's self-realized, and they stop doing anything, and maybe they take up some really you know strange activities like Padmasambhava or you know some of these other uh, Tibetans you know frolicking in the cremation grounds and stuff like that then common people will take it up too and because of that they'll be ruined because maybe the self-realized person can do it but they sure can't they create very bad karma, very serious karma for themselves. And this is what happens with the neo Advaitins. Confirmed. See, <laughs> the whole universe is conscious. You know? And <laughs> it's like this, this topic of the neo Advaitins comes up and gets discussed extensively in the comments and so forth, just as the same information comes up in the readings of the scripture. I didn't plan that. It just happened. It's a synchronicity. And you'll find that there, I mean, this was first observed by, in the West anyway, by Carl Jung, that whenever you start meditating and stuff like that, the world starts to rhyme with your state of consciousness. So it's not surprising then that when the subject comes up in our community, on our channel, that it'll also come up in the scripture readings and exactly the same, <laughs> same arguments on both sides will be made and then confirmed by no less an authority than Lord Brahma that those who try to jump up artificially fall down. And we've seen it. Thank you. We've seen it practically, especially in Tiruvannamalai, which has become like the world center of Neo-Advaita now. Uh, we see that so many of these young rascals are coming and they're taking drugs and acting in all kinds of licentious ways and uh, I mean you know there's heavy drugs being sold in Tiruvannamalai and people are making an enormous amount of money about that's why nobody complains about it because all the locals are getting rich by selling their properties and and by offering various services to these tourists. So everybody's getting rich, including Raman Ashrama. So they don't say a word about it, even though back in 1950s, 55, 56, there was quite a discussion in the Raman Ashrama uh, monthly magazine about this very subject. Should we take a stand on neo Advaita? And basically, they buried the issue. And, and this was also about the time that Sadhu Om and some of the other actually realized disciples of Ramana were kicked out of the ashram. This was just after Ramana left his body. So we see that the association with offensive people is poisonous. If you can't through some means or other, make them 
shut up and listen. Huh? Uh, if they keep up with their offensive chatter, then you will fall down if you associate with them. In fact, it's described in, in scriptures in several places that if you are in the company of someone who is blaspheming, who is offensive, who demeans the Supreme Lord or the worship of the Lord or the scriptures or the devotees, that you have to cut out his tongue. And if you can't do that, you have to commit suicide. If you can't, you know, just escape the situation. So this is a very serious matter. You know, that, that's, that's why these rascals get away with it, because people don't realize how serious it is, nor do they have the depth of commitment that they would be willing to do something about it. Now, if I encouraged, here's an example, if I were to encourage Neo-Adwaita viewpoints on this channel, this channel would get huge. Huh? I mean, you look at some of these other channels, people glibly talking about Adwaita, and they have thousands of subscribers and thousands of views on every video. Uh, why don't we? Well, it's because we don't compromise. We stick with what the Shastra says, and people don't like that. Well, too bad. We're not going to change. And because we don't have a, a, a big temple to support, we don't have, like, many disciples to uh, take care of. We don't have a big organization. In fact, we don't have any organization, and that is quite by design. Because we don't want to have any pressure on us to compromise our points of view. We want to stay true to the scriptures. The scriptures are very unpopular these days, you know, uh, except for these rascals who take things out of context and use it to rationalize and justify their misconduct. But other than that, people don't make much of a big deal about scriptures or they don't pay much attention to what the scriptures say. And of course, this is a tragedy because the scriptures are giving all the secrets. The thing is, the scriptures are covered. Actually, they're cursed. You find if you investigate into mantras such as the Gayatri mantra or the Mahasodashi mantra or any number of other esoteric tantric mantras, that the mantras are cursed. And before you can chant the mantra, and get any benefit from it, you have to pray to the Rishi who originated the mantra to remove the curses. And people almost never do that. Huh? There are three things, three authorities in the uh, practice of any mantra. The Rishi, the uh, Deva, and the Shastra from which it comes. Now, in the Vedic view, Shastras are also living people. So the Rishis who wrote the Shastra, the Devas, the demigods or gods who inspire them, and the scripture itself all put curses on the scriptures and the mantras therein. So if you try to practice these mantras, or if you try to comprehend these scriptures without removing the curse, somehow or other, without getting the favor of the Rishi or the Deva or the Shastra itself, you won't get it. You'll misinterpret it, you'll misapply it, and you'll fall down. It'll become a cause of suffering for you. So this, in my mind, accounts for the fact that the scriptures are very unpopular today. Because even the people who claim to be studying scriptures or practicing the scriptures don't take the trouble to remove the curses. They, they try to practice these mantras like Gayatri and others without 
uh, satisfying the sage, which in the case of Gayatri is Vyas, uh, the guru Vyas, and the uh, sage, uh, who is the sage? Vishvamitra. And Brahma is the sponsor, the, the god. So without trying to satisfy those three, Gayatri won't have much of any result. How are they satisfied? Well, there are uh, actual mantras that you can use to pray to them to remove the curses. Or also just any general devotional service that is offered to them. And one's sincerity in general will lead to the curses being removed. But this is, this is rarer, more rare. I don't know, whatever it is. Anyway, somehow or other, you have to get the curses removed before the mantras or the scriptures will have any effect. So, of course, the Neo-Dwaitans don't believe in any of this. They think it's all Maya, which is by Srila Prabhupada, my Adi Guru, called the Maya Vadis. Huh? because they think everything is maya. Well, everything is maya. <laughs> but as long as you're in the state of consciousness in which maya appears real, you're still subject to cause and effect within that illusion. You know, it's like you can say, for example, countries are maya. You know, it's like somebody draws a map and, and draws a line on the map and says, this is our country. <laughs> it's totally abstraction. It's totally just words. It's arbitrary. It has nothing to do. If you go out there and look, you won't find any line. It's only in people's heads. They, they draw the line on the map and then they say, this is such and such country. Huh? And of course, anything... That, that we say is what happens in this country. This is our country. And so nationalism and other nonsense-isms spring up. But they're all abstractions. They're all just like uh, hypnotic conditioning. If people walk around and say, I'm in this country, I'm in that country, I'm a citizen of a country X or Y or Z. But it's just words. But because they believe in it, they become subject to it. Try to understand. Because they believe the country exists, they believe they're a citizen of this country, they believe all the laws of that country apply to them, and so on like that. Now, I'm not advocating breaking any laws, but I am advocating being conscious of the nature of countries and laws and so on like that. Well, the same is true of religions and spiritual paths. If you say, I am a member of such and such a religion, or I am practicing such and such a spiritual path, you become subject to the rules and regulations of that path. So if you say, I'm a follower of Ramana Maharshi and I'm practicing Advaita, well, Ramana Maharshi's Advaita includes the worship of Shiva. So, are you worshiping Shiva? No. How do you expect to get the benefit? How do you expect to get the result? You're not playing the game according to the rules. So, you're going to get disqualified. <laughs> like if you're playing a game like football and you break the rules, the ref is like, Whoosh, you're out. <laughs> or whatever the penalty is. You know? So it's the same way in spiritual life. If you say, I am a Vedic householder, Brahmana, well, then uh, do, you, do you take, do you have five fires going continuously in which five deities are worshiped? And do you chant Gayatri a thousand times in the morning? and so on and so on. So many regulations that apply to brahmanas. And if the answer to any of those is no, it means you've fallen. You screwed up. <laughs> and there's going to be a penalty for that. See? I don't know why people think that cheating is normal 
Well, I guess cheating has become normalized in our society today. Cheating, lying, stealing, raping, so many discriminations against this and that has all become normalized, at least in certain parts of the society, among unenlightened people. And so people think it's just fine to do the same with religion. But in religion, you're not just dealing with a society or a country or a government even. You're dealing with God, the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God. So <laughs> you're not going to get away with it. You know, it is going to affect you if you mess up these things. But on the other hand, if you follow the principles given in the scriptures, you'll get the results that are given in the scriptures. It's that simple. The scriptures don't lie. Sometimes they obfuscate <laughs> a little bit. Sometimes they give some false story just so that later on they can refute it and give the truth and so on like that. But these are teaching tactics. They're not lies because they lead to the realization of the truth, if you follow them. So the point is, you have to follow them. And if you do, you get the result. And if you don't, you're out. Sorry, disqualified. You lose your license. Off the field with you. So this is the reality, and this is what the scriptures say, and this is why we follow them. And this is why we don't associate with offensive people and so many other things. Why we always chant the Shiva mantra or the mantra of whatever deity that we are worshiping at the time. And there's a record of this on this channel. You can see videos five, ten years ago of me meditating as a Buddhist monk doing elaborate worship of Shakti in my house in Tiruvannamalai. All the videos are right there on this channel. I've done the sadhana. I followed the path. I got the result. And you can too. Om Tatsat. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya.